Hey, Michael. Can you hear me? Hey, how's it going? Going well. Sorry about being a little bit late here. Oh, yeah, totally fine. Um, Justin's already got this recording, so he'll Okay. just have to edit out a couple minutes or whatever. So, Gotcha. and then I'll I'll just text him when we're done. So, Okay. got the kids all settled then. Got it. Nice. Well, I imagine it'll be kind of similar to last time here, maybe hour ish, probably not much longer than that, I wouldn't think. So, Sounds good. all right. Well, whenever you're ready here, I'll give a little pause and then we'll dump, jump in. All right, let's do it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to DJ's Epic Quest. Just Derek here tonight alongside Michael Roberti, who has graciously. Come back for round number two here to talk about book number two, A Grave for Us All. Um, so we'll have a little chat about that and, and see where things go and, and hope we have a good time. Absolutely. Well, how has uh, the early school year been for you? <laughs> um, hectic but good. Uh, just you know, a lot of a lot of moving parts um, and uh, doing drivers that still. So it's kind of a mixture of that kids activities and uh, trying to get you know everything balanced. It's it's juggling for sure, and it's not always easy. So yeah, you know how that goes. Are you were you guys affected much by the hurricane, the storm, and all that? Or are you guys pretty safe where you're at? Oh, we we were good. Um, we had the power flicker on and off a little bit um, Friday morning, but it was actually um, like Western North Carolina. We're in the central Piedmont area, but the uh, the mountains got hit really hard, especially uh, like Asheville and uh, Boone, where I went to college. Um, there's like some videos and pictures, and it's like it's horrific. So hopefully, um, that, you know, those people get the help that they need. And uh, I know that they're starting to set up like uh, you know, like water to, water. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, disbursement centers and stuff like that and try to get food out there. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, the response is quick for a lot of those people out that way. I haven't really heard much about it because my my sister lives kind of down your way and I haven't heard anything from her. So I assumed it wasn't too bad, but uh, yeah, but I haven't, yeah, like even on like the news and stuff, or at least what I've looked at it, they haven't really talked about it. So I didn't know what it was like, but um, well, maybe if you wouldn't mind here, if I, if you just want to introduce yourself again here, I hopefully people who listen to the first one will know who you are for the second one, but on the off chance that maybe that isn't the case. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm Michael Roberti. Um, I wrote um, the first two and a half books of the Crown of Tide series of what it's going to be eventually the Trader Verse. Um, I currently review for fanfeeaddict.com. Uh, Um, and I'm hosting a show called Authors and Adventures, where we invite indie authors or other authors, if you know, if George R. R. Martin wants to come and do his thing, uh, doing Dungeons and Dragons adventures. And um, I'm also a contributor to Willow Wraith Press with Bill Adams, Andrew D. Meredith, Timothy Wolf, and Dewey Conway. You have a very full plate. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, but man, could you imagine how awesome that would be if George Barton came and played Dungeons and Dragons? Like, that would be unreal. I gotta shoot my shot. Well, I don't know if I'm the platform to get him on for you, but <laughs> Steven Erickson, if you would like to, if you would like to play, I have not read your books, but I will, I will definitely do so before we play. <laughs> That uh, man, if you could get those two guys in a room together, yeah, it'd be interesting. That would be interesting. Um, something else, maybe I just kind of thought of here. If, if uh, again, somebody's just kind of jumping in to listen to a conversation, um, maybe if you want to give like a too long, didn't read type breakdown of your books here. Okay, sure. Uh, so the Crime Tide series. is uh, set on the backdrop of a uh, rebellion between a cultural and religious minority in uh, the Kingdom of Harfalm. And uh, we kind of start in media res in traders where we're at towards the end of that conflict. Um, and then uh, about halfway through, we kind of decide, you know, discover that what we thought were the stakes, what we thought were the major players may not be 100%, you know, on the level and that some people may be exploiting 
um, the conflict for their own personal gain. Uh, it takes place in a world where when you uh, die or when a person dies, everything they write disappears. And uh, that plays fairly, a little bit significantly in Traitors, a little bit more significantly in gra uh, A Grave for Us All. Um, and A Grave for Us All picks up where Traitors left off. Um, you know, Traitors has a little bit of a, uh, well, I mean, quite a bit of a cliffhanger ending where there's a lot of major events that happen. And Grave uh, looks at the fallout of those events and takes them a step further. Um, and as, as the title implies, things are not going well in the Kingdom of Harfall. No, it's it's not great. <laughs> no, that is true. Um, so yeah, I've, similar to last time, I've got a list of questions, and they're they're kind of all over the place here. They're not in any sort of particular order. Um, but yeah, I'll just run through them here, and and uh, I'll see what you have to say. Hopefully, I got some good questions for you. Sure. Um, uh, there was I don't really remember where it was in the book, but there was a part where Kale has a thought about being a bastard mm -hmm. and there's all the other unclaimed children of the realm mm -hmm. and I, I know you have a book i think that you've at least tentatively titled i don't know if it'll change but the unclaimed girl is that kind mm -hmm. of where that came from actually not at all <laughs> oh, okay. uh, but, so that claimed girl is actually like an earlier idea so still set in the same world um, but it's uh, it's probably a few hundred years in the future from traders and uh, in the uh, the area of um, kind of the Midlands called Matavia. But uh, that deals with um, without getting too much into a spoiler because I accidentally spoiled this a little too much in interviews a couple years ago. But I wrote a book many many years ago that I didn't release because it was terrible, and I really wanted to reimagine some of those uh, concepts. But basically. It's going to start off in this girl who's an immigrant to Matavia. She's from uh, south of Soldas in an area called um, uh, Dor Atlish. And, uh, or Dor Atlish. Mm -hmm. No, hold on. Dor Atlish. Yeah. Um, no, sorry. Dahator. She's from Dahator. Da that's the other one. My bad. I'm, I'm very tired. <laughs> and so I'm, I don't know. Ho I, yeah, hopefully, you know, I'll get this straight. But anyway. Uh, you know, which so she moved with her family for uh, a better education because basically the land south of Soldas was abandoned by Soldas due to uh, raiders and all sorts of things. And they just like, we can't hold on to this land. We're going to build a wall and just cut them off. Um, and there's a few other things, for instance, um, kind of similar to the Reach and Harfall, uh, the Hitori were um, persecuted by the Soldasi. But in this case, they were actually driven out of the realm and been like, they almost like uh, Trail of Tears style, moved to another area. Anyway, she eventually, her family goes there and then uh, was, uh, she, she wakes up one morning and her mom does not remember that she has a brother. And um, not only that, but his room is gone. Like not even like, that there's nothing in the room. The room itself is gone. And the weird thing is, being an eighth from the Traitorverse, his name is still in the signature book for the family. So she's trying to kind of figure out what happened to him while other weird things keep happening around her. I feel like just from that, like, I'm immediately trying to think like, okay, well, how does this room disappearing tie into like writing disappearing and all that type of stuff? Um, there's a, there's a, there's a big twist. Well, wait and see, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to push it back a little bit. I was, I was making a lot of progress on it, but I'm, I'm a little bit more motivated to get credit tied three out faster um, without rushing just because uh, I feel like the timing is, is right for it you know what i mean sure yeah definitely the the prologue for grave does that yeah. follow right after the prologue for traders yeah yeah that's uh basically immediately after um the only difference is that last little bit traders where Jana um is uh noticing the fires it, that probably is towards the end of the prologue in grave um, but yeah, that's that's like immediately after um, just the different perspective. Okay, because I was I I thought so, but I wasn't sure because if I remember right, the ships had cannons, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which I thought was really cool. And then I was kind of like, well, I wonder if we're going to see some like flint 
flintlock type guns or something that can pop up at some point. So uh, the idea with that is um, without giving too much away, because I think towards the end of Grave, like, it, it kind of comes up that, you know, where they're from and that there there was that everybody forgot where they're from. Um, but it's kind of like when they came over, they had the cannons and they had the the the, the gunpowder or whatever. Um, but the people on the ships may not have known how to make the gunpowder or how to where to get it or like what what it, what it is exactly. And then, like, you know, especially, like, think about what we forgot from 180 years ago, and we have writing that exists from 180 years ago, but, you know, without without meticulously keeping detail of that technology, where it comes from, how to use it, it's possible that it got lost. Um, you know, uh, we're going to find out more about the people on the ships in the next book, and uh, they're not exactly the um, scientific type, if that makes sense. Okay. All right, I'll look forward to that. Um, so uh, this question I kind of had in like multiple parts as I kind of was reading through the book. Um, and I like some things kind of dawned on me, but I just kind of left it all as is and just kind of added to it. Um, so Zopa can control other people. Mm -hmm. He can't like their physical bodies, but their minds are still their own, it seems. Yeah. Like, I guess they probably know, like, they realize, like, what they're doing to them, themselves, and they like, I don't want to do this, but they can't stop it. Right. Um. So, well, yeah, because, like, in the first book, he's got the guy ramming his head into the wall, so he can clearly force people to do something they don't, like, agree right. with. Mm -hmm. Um. Does he, I guess, I don't remember if we see him ever really relinquish that control or not so uh, um sorry continue i, I just i kind of had like all this thought that before this was all kind of before zopa made these guys kill each other so i didn't really know if it like mm -hmm. would still stand up you know if they had decided you know once he let go of that control if they didn't murder each other maybe they'll try to come after him but then I don't know yeah. how that's going to work because it'll just be like, oh, you're back again. Mind control. Right. Die. <laughs> right. So um, the way the way I kind of view his power and I'm not I'm not a, a hard magic system kind of guy. So it is it is a little bit loose, um, but he has uh, usually with his own people. It's a very passive control because they allow him to do it so that they're not struggling against him. So he's not having to invest a whole lot of power to get them to do what he wants. In the case of those guys, um, you know, I think that it mentions like, you know, I think it's Kale's perspective uh, that the air is shimmering and that they're very like that, like they're trying, they're kind of resisting, but they're they're not able to. But it's just it depends on how much power he's expending is like how much he can get people to do. So like a lot of times if you look at it, um, there's the scene at the movie theater, or at the, not the movie, the movie theater, at the theater <laughs> where um, he kind of, he kind of. He kind of controls people, but like just enough to make it look like it's worse than it is. And that that so he's not really spending much power. But like then at Mathis's uh estate, all he has them do is stand still. So like it's like how hard is how hard is that? And then I realized that there's a slight oh, excuse me, I got burp. Hmm. Sorry, you can no cut worries. that out. Um, but uh so uh there, there, like there's there's like two like and I kind of didn't think about it, like he's like, why did um why did he not mind control Mathis's wife? It was like, and I realized that after I published the book, I'm like, oh, but I have a good explanation for it is because he kind of has an idea when he's doing this, what people's attitudes and whatever is. And he either thought that she wasn't worth doing because she's so weak and so like insignificant to Mathis or because she saw that he, she's actually actively um, hates Mathis. You know what I mean? And like, so it wouldn't be like a punishment for her really. Gotcha. Yeah, because then she just stabs him. Yeah, right. But, yeah. Um, so that, that scene in the theater, I remember you said that there was, a, I think that was roughly halfway through the book. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I remember you saying that there was a scene in the second book that was supposed to be in the first. Was that it? Actually, it was the finale uh, was supposed to be in the first book. Um, because that was going to be the, the finale, uh, like of the whole book was supposed to be, uh, Marilee and Emil's wedding night. Oh, okay. 
But then they had really good good chemistry, and I was like, I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about it. Like, man, I wonder, I wonder what that was. So that that was my thought is what it was supposed to be, but I guess not. Yeah, it, that was the the first scene I ever came up with was uh, merrily killing a meal. So spoiler, oh. if you haven't, you know, I mean, I I think this is pretty obviously a spoiler filled uh, episode, but. Uh, if you want to like, ble- like if it's not, leave those two names out, I guess. But it's probably, <laughs> yeah, no, they're it's definitely spoilers. Yeah, yeah that th- that's the ending definitely surprised me. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't sure what was going to happen, and uh, you know, I just like merely just seemed so unhappy, and it just like it felt like there was a lot of postpartum depression there within yeah. her. And, yeah, that was that was a hard one to get right, and I, I think I did. And that same thing with Emil in this book is like, like you, I wanted them to be so close to like at the beginning of being happy, like oh, this is real, this could happen. You know, she's she's kind of happy around the time she's pregnant, and uh, he is not, you know, hasn't started really his descent yet. He started it a little bit, but not like crazy. But then it was kind of became like, well, how do I? get them to the point where I need them to be. So then I was like, well, you know, maybe there's a little bit of a postpartum thing there. Um, and I mean, the other thing I think too, is, you know, Marilee at this point, I think is 19. Um, I don't think she's, she was 18 in book one. Um, I think if I recall, I planned it out where I think book one is about between like a few weeks and two or three months, maybe. And uh, book two is about a year long. And uh, so she was 18. She's probably about 19. And, you know, she's, been thrust into this role that she does not want of being uh the governess of the of the of the reach and then as well uh you know sleeping with the man who killed her her older brother her fiance is dead um you know she's got this baby now that looks like a meal and you know and that, part of that too i think um like not, not exactly i mean i i amplified it a lot but i you know Childbirth, and I like it. You know, it's it's a hard thing for a woman. You know, even if you're expecting it and stuff like that, there's a lot of difficulties, especially for a new mom and especially for a young mom. You know, things sure. don't go as easy as you think they're going to go. Um, and then, you know, of course, she has her absentee husband who um, is you know drinking too much. Uh, is kind of got this idea of he can fix everything, but is making things way worse and he's killing people that look a lot like you, you know? So I think, I think I got, I think I, I think I got that where I wanted to, but it, that took a lot of work to get that like that, you know? It, it was really good. And it was, I think as far as like just a, a really, it's like, you know, when he names the baby, mm-hmm. something different than what she wanted. You know, she wanted Finbar. And, yeah. Um, it starts with an M. Marcel. Marcel. I was going to say Maurice. Yeah. Um, but it was just like, I felt that betrayal. Mm, and I was like, yeah. and it was cold and it was, and it was, man, that was just mean. <laughs> um, yeah. And as far as, you know, like a, a nonviolent act of betrayal, like it hit hard. So it was, yeah. I thought it was really well done and, and I was like, I cannot believe he just did this. <laughs> and, uh, I thought it was executed really well. I appreciate that, man. I, I that's that that was one of the things I had was I was like, that needs to happen. And then um, there's a few like a few other minor things where I'm like, I need it to be enough that she kills him. You know what I mean? Because like originally she's just gonna kill him because it's like you're you know you're you're a keepling, you know. But I like I I think that ended up being a lot better than what I originally planned. Yeah, it it was really good because, yeah, she doesn't like him. She's got a lot of reasons not to like him, and then they kind of slowly build a connection, and then, you know, like you said, he has this descent, and and then it turns, and it's just, I would imagine, kind of a, another layer of shock, for Marilee at that point, and um, I was I was really invested into it. Yeah, um, yeah. I was just like, I just feel bad for. Her. Yeah. And I feel bad too because she's like my favorite. Like she's definitely like number one or number two for my favorite characters to write. Because like I feel like she has a lot of um, like I guess depth that like for instance, Kale has some depth, but not a lot. You know what I mean? He's got two modes: sad boy and angry boy. Whereas Merely has a little <laughs> bit of like 
I think it's like the hope that kills you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, she she definitely has that, and I I definitely towards the end of the book before she killed Emil, I just I was like, man, I I just don't have a good feeling. Also, I don't have a good feeling for uh, Eric and mm. Freya. Uh, Freya, yeah. Sorry, it's it's yeah, been like a, a week, week and a half since I finished no, this book. Good. So <laughs> pretty good. But I don't. Yeah, I feel like there's not a happy ending there for those two either. So. I don't want to spoil anything. So I've got I've got the end of all the major characters um, in my head. I got to get I kind of like the same thing as Grave, where I have to get from point A to point B. Um, I really like the ending for all of them, and there's a few that might be slightly up in the air. Um, Freya and Eric's, though, I think um, for for both of them, I think that the end their ending might be my favorite ending for for a few different reasons. Um, it's going to be tough to get there, but I think that's going to be a cool one. And then um, Marilise, I thought was a good one, but now, like, I think it's going to be like, I, so I've been writing the chapters out of order and uh, there's some really, really good moments I've got to already that I'm really excited about. And I think um, Marilise's character growth, which I already really liked is going kind of through the roof, which I'm hoping once again, that it lands, but we'll see. I don't know. I just kind of make things up. Write it down, <laughs> you know? That's interesting. Uh, um so it's i guess a question that's just coming to my head now i didn't have written down just based on what you said so you said you're writing these chapters out of order Uh, do you find that difficult do you think like how you're going to order this stuff later down the line um like what kind of challenge do you think that'll present or do you think it won't be too big of a deal um because i know like i'm pretty sure that i heard like steven erickson for example, his Malzan books, he just, you know, wrote them beginning to end each one all the way through. Right. And I guess like as somebody who's never written anything, like, sure, that makes sense in my head, but to execute that is probably also not easy at all. It's, it's gotten harder with the, with where where I'm at now with it. So with traders, I mostly wrote it beginning to end with a few chapters I threw in afterwards, like the, the prologue, I threw in at the end, the intermission chapters kind of came close to the end. And I think maybe, I, I don't know. I, th- I think I mostly did it mostly in order grave. I wrote completely out of order. Um, and in fact, like some chapters moved, like I forget, I forget what the original order was. Um, but I think the first Freya chapter was later. And then uh, I got some feedback and I was like, well, I need to add a kale chapter because kale's original first chapter was like chapter six. It's like I was like uh, Bill Adams who, who edits for me is like, well, that's that's way too late to have a kale chapter. And I'm like, OK. And so um, actually, like, I think that what made Grave work better than Traders, in my opinion, even though I really still like Traders, is Traders. I was afraid to take risks and I just wrote beginning to end. Uh, I was like, well, maybe I could pull this off. Let's try this part. Maybe I could pull this off. Let's try this. And it, like, that's why, like. Part one is no risks at all for traders. And some people really like that. It's just military fiction. And part two is where I was like, oh, let's see what I can do with this. And then Grave was like, well, let's let's see what I can pull off. And like, uh, for instance, um, there's a chapter with Kale and Core uh where they're where they go to an inn and it's kind of out on the way to Mathis, and the inn gets attacked by, you know, by by the uh by an army, I think one of the princes. And that was like, I think the last chapter I wrote, but like, that's probably like one of the best chapters in the book, um, according to a few people. And um, there's a few other ones like that, like a lot of the, the polyer um, or polyer or however you want to say it. And like the turned all people, a lot of that stuff I wrote last, like I wrote almost after the entire rest of the book. And I think that like those bridges kind of, kind of helped uh, get from point A to point B. Um, and I actually wrote like Zora's uh, intermission was one of the first things I wrote and then I only wrote half of it. And then I kind of talked myself into it with the, the Zopa stuff where I was like, okay, like why does she, why did, and I kind of knew why she hated her dad, but I didn't know how to get there with it. And uh, I think that that helped having Zopa really f- like firm as a character. I don't know that I would have been able to to write that when I had originally started it. But I mean, like the other thing too, is like, I spread that out a lot. Like I wrote, um, Merrily, Eric, uh, Emil, and Freya's first chapters, and like 
February or March 2022. And then the rest, uh, I wrote like 60,000 words in 2022. And then I wrote the remaining like 90,000 in 2023. And I'm mostly in the second half because I was just so busy. And then um, I had it pretty much ready to go by the end of 2023 and then released it just, you know, in April. Gotcha. Yeah, that's, I don't know how you, you, you juggle all that stuff in your head and uh, I'm sure there must be a lot of like jotting down notes and like outlining type stuff and, and everything like that, or maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. I uh, I have a rough outline and uh, I, I change it as I go, but like mostly it's just kind of, it's kind of up here. Like I, some things come, some things go. I try things like I've had, like I've had a couple of really like stupid, stupid ideas and some of them I wrote down and then just scrapped. And most of the time it just doesn't ever get to the point where I'm going to write it down. Cause I'm like, that doesn't really work. Let me think about that some more. Like I thought I had this plot line where Kale was going to learn magic from Zopa. And I'm like, that's stupid. Why would that happen? And then uh, I had this, and I still kind of think it's kind of a funny idea, but at one point I thought it'd be kind of funny if Freya became the second witch of Loma. And then I was like, that's also kind of stupid too. You know what I mean? But sometimes it's like, you know, you don't get good ideas until you get a bunch of bad ideas. I guess you got to kind of work through them. Do you ever have like, you wake up like in the middle of the night with an idea and you're like, I got to write this down before I forget it type deal? Sort of. I Except for that, I just never write it down. I just... Like for some reason, like it's one of the things I'm actually pretty good at keeping track of in my head is like the plot beats and stuff like that. Um, like every so often I have to look something up, but um, for the most part, like it just it's just up there. Like that's how I play Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I've started trying to write some of this stuff down because um, like I like I play I haven't played in a while, but Dungeons and Dragons in the setting, and I have my, my one of my best friends uh, DMs in the setting, and then other tables are doing the setting too. Um, so some of the lore stuff that like I'll write down just so like they know it or that I don't forget. And then, you know, the other thing too, is like, sometimes it changes over time. Like, um, like, you know, there's, there's been like several, several big changes. Like when I, uh, when I first came up with the reach, they were, they were mercenaries, like they kind of are now, but they were like the unsullied from, um, a song of ice and fire, very, uh, stoic and very rigid. And then like somehow they became the Viking Scotch Irish, uh people that they are now you know uh so it's just like it's just always evolving gotcha cool um next question here sorry for a couple of random ones just oh, off fine, the top of the like, head there um is it olivier i'm not sure how that's kind of how i wrote it in my name olivier I, I, I I can't pronounce any of these names. Like I come up with them and then my wife's like that's not how that's said you need to make sure you ask me like so like uh it should probably be Olivier. I always thought it was uh, Olivere or whatever, you know. Same thing with, like, uh, like uh, my wife says it's Horace. I always called him Horach or Horach. Um, but I just, I'm bad at pronouncing names, dude. I, like, I I just, I don't know. But, yeah, so, yes, uh, Olivier. Um, I'm kind of, kind of wondering what his art is. If, like, is it just, just straight up torture? I, I, I think so. I, I left it kind of blank on purpose and um, I was originally going to like keep it completely in the dark, but yeah, basically it's some, it's some type of uh, like murder torture. That's kind of what I was picking up, but I like, wasn't sure if there was something else there. Um, yeah. Uh, this was pretty dark. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is like, I was telling somebody, cause people say like, well, people thought Traders was grim dark, and like uh, I think uh, Andy Peliquin, with his recent review, said it said it best. Is it's kind of grim dark light. Like there's there's definitely grim dark elements, and I'd say that there's like three grim dark characters in Grave that make the make it significantly darker. But then you know it's it's never quite as bad as like especially modern grim dark is just like just straight up like grim black. You know what I mean? Like uh, even. Um, you know, for instance, uh, a lot of people reference Berserk as one of their uh, big reference points and uh, uh influences and i don't think i like i don't think i could get through it you know what i mean like that's just too much for me um so i, I try not to um go too far down that path like I, like you know zopa mathis and uh olivier um all have you know sort of very grim dark tendencies but mostly they're, they're shown off page other than zopa because zopa is just kind of cool so he gets a little bit of a pass zopa is pretty cool and i remember like <laughs> I, I, it wasn't something I was expecting to learn, but you know he's got his magic powder and yeah, um, he's burning people. Oh yeah, to get, to get it. I'm like oh wow, 
And I, I mean, I like the grimdark stuff. Like, I don't think I've read anything where I'm like, oh, that was too much. Um, yeah. I mean, I haven't read like First Law or anything yet, but. Oh, dude, First Law's not that dark. For this, this, this the, the, I would say it's a similar tone. Okay. Yeah. So, like, First um, Law is like uh, old grimdark. New grimdark is like. Um, I, I mean, Berserk would be the, like the reference point for me, like, where there's like on screen especially like because it's a graphic you know novel manga like straight up sexual assault like right on, on the page you know what i mean or um i i've heard uh so yeah you know there, i don't want to like call people out <laughs> but there's there's some grim dark books out there that are very uh pushing the envelope on what they portray uh sure. first of all it's dark but like and like they, you know you know joe abercrombie's lord grim dark but I never once was like, oh, this is too much. Whereas there there have been books where I'm like, eh, I'm not gonna read this. Hmm. Yeah, I've I've not come across that yet. Um, but I would be curious to like if I would find something like that or not. Um, mm -hmm. but um so the do we do we know who the ships belong to in the prologue? Are they Tristan McCassins? I'm not sure so, if I said his last name right. Yeah. So, so uh, in the it, 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 like it's it's kind of easy to overlook because I, I I hinted at it at the at the beginning of the book and then it was a little bit more explicit at the end. So um, it turns out that there was there was no trust in Micahson. Uh, we're gonna find out why there wasn't in the next book, but it was actually uh, Raider's uh, ancestor and Alvin's ancestor. It was like Ashto Treden, and I forget what Freighter's uh, ancestor's name is. Um, but we're going to find out exactly who they are, what they're doing, and why they're over there. Um, and it's it's kind of like just a random chance kind of thing, mostly more than anything, which is you know kind of how those things tend to go. Gotcha. Oh, I guess I should have. <laughs> One of my, like, the last questions I had written down was that uh, I was like, well, oh, wait, so there is no... Yeah, no trust in yeah that, that he yeah. well basically and this will be a like a very very minor spoiler for the prologue of until worms remain but um it's going to come so the language that they speak is very similar to uh what the the harful oh yikes sorry I spilled the water um what the harful <laughs> natives speak and that's because a long long time ago there was a person named uh Micah Lex Lesk son um who had a crusade and it spanned most of the world so uh the language is actually like similar so when they finally disembark um the the, the ship they're on is actually called the micah's sun like the sun in the sky and it sounds like he's saying my name is trusted micahson but he's what he's saying is i'm treading of micah's son the the ship um so they kind of realized that because like and I kind of took this a little bit from the Columbus accounts where like people didn't know what to make of Columbus because it's like who is this dude why is he in this huge ship that you know it's nothing like our ships and so basically uh same kind of thing is he becomes kind of a uh, cult figure and they decide well um because of why they're there which uh well I'll talk about that later maybe um they decide that the, it's best if they believe in this scary guy named Tristan Mikinson who is this conqueror and um they kind of they kind of divvy it up like that where uh the trustinsons are the family with the fame and then the hammersons are the family that's kind of running things behind the scenes and making money and uh that's kind of like the arrangement there gotcha yeah that was uh that was a pretty big bombshell i thought I'm like well this guy never <laughs> yeah. wait what and all i've heard you know i keep hearing things about him and he wasn't even real so it was, yeah. it was a pretty big surprise well, that's why I kind of wonder too about like something that's like Johnny Appleseed. Like, was that a guy? Paul Bunyan? I don't know. You know, we got a statue of him here up in Minnesota. Yeah. So, right, yeah, <laughs> must maybe, be real. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, I guess we we kind of talked about this already, but um, just with Marley, um, and her baby, you know, just like. I didn't feel like she could connect with the baby at all. And she just yeah. must feel like she was just completely used. And again, just to that, just a, a brutal turn for her. Um, more of a thought there than a question. But Oh yeah, for sure. That that was something like, I tried to wrap that in with like, like a few things like, you know, the fact that she definitely is having like some sort of postpartum things. She kind of hates a meal 
And like, I, I mean, this is like my, my wife, you know, never was like that exactly. I mean, she did have some issues, not like not as serious, but like, uh, like I remember when my son was born, like he would just eat and eat and eat and eat like the cluster feeding or whatever. Like he just never stopped. And it was like very mentally taxing for my wife. Cause she had to sit there and just like, she couldn't move or do anything. And like, I was just thinking, I'm like, well, you know, that's like I, I, I th- and that's actually like I'm not like gonna say I'm trying to raise awareness because I'm not, but like I think that's something that we do a disservice to women with is that everybody acts like breastfeeding is the easiest thing in the world and it's just so natural, but like it's really difficult like for a lot of women, and uh, not only like you know do you have to worry about stuff like can you can the baby figure it out, but like are you making enough milk you know stuff like that. This is a weird. Yeah. This is a weird answer, <laughs> but like, it, it's, I, I, I like you know, like, yeah, I, I think it's impossible not to get influenced by real life. But that was one thing that I remember thinking, like, you know, it was just a very difficult thing. And I mean, imagine now that, like, you know, not only that, but you don't even love your husband, and like, you've just been completely used up, and there's this baby that you named yeah, right, yeah, yeah, that would be tough for sure. Uh, I'm curious. You know, from your experience of writing traders, you know, what you learned, what did you take from that and how did you apply that to Grave and, and kind of Ooh. to leapfrog from there? Same thing with Grave going to, you know, I, I'm not sure how far you are into until worms remain, but I imagine there's been lessons, um, mm. things you've, you know, thought, okay, well, I'm going to do this different, you know, that type of thing. Just, I uh, guess, from, you know, the experiences you've had. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, the biggest thing is building confidence. Um, and I've had a few people tell me that, that they felt like even like the first book, like that I started trusting my writing more, um, which I mean, makes sense. Cause I, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I'm just like, I've never finished a book before. Uh, well, I mean, I edited one time and it sucked, uh, but I never edited a book or published it or whatever. And so partly was like trusting myself. Cause like, I, you know, um, especially with traders, I was like, you know, I'm going to release this and who knows what's going to happen. Um, you know, maybe like, you know, like I had some visions in my head as like, well, you know, you know, maybe a few people read it or, you know, like I actually, I fully expected, I'm like, I'm probably gonna get mostly three star, four star reviews and, you know, maybe I'll make a little bit of money or, you know, I'll have a little bit of, you know, a little bit of headway. And then it's probably not going to be enough that people are really going to be pressuring me for the second book, which is great. And then eventually people, you know, as I write and release more books, people go to this book and uh, find it in the, like, you know, find it be like, oh, hey, that's pretty good. And, it, you know, the originally too, like it was like, it, to me, it was one of the more iconic stories from the world that I had come up with, but it wasn't the, it's still not, even though I really love it, it like it's really taking my life on its own, but like um, there are bigger, more complex stories. So I was trying to find a way to teach myself how to write. So, so there's that. So I, I kind of got confidence. I kind of, the biggest thing too, is taking more risks. Like I started thinking to myself instead of like, well, what, what am I capable of? I'm like, well, let's see what I can, let's, let's push this a little bit further. You know, let's let's see. Um, I think, you know, I I knew that people like the characters of traders when I got to grave and, uh, mostly, mostly people like the, the pacing. I tried to vary it up a little bit more with, um, how I told the story. So like, you know, um, I try to like add more to the world. Cause like, that was the thing too, is like, you know, traders is like a very hyper local story. It, It takes place in the missing tide and then the keep and there's not really a whole lot of other places and then i was like okay let's 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 expand the playbook a little bit because i mean like the world as a whole like has a lot to it and um i'm trying to i'm trying to kind of balance what's canon from dungeons and dragons and the stories in my head to what makes sense from a a writing standpoint if that makes sense so like uh i, I don't want to write anything that's contradicted what i wrote in traders but at the same time i don't want to um like limited too much either. I think I answered the question, but I'm not sure. No, definitely. Uh, I also I think you know reading. I read your books pretty close to back to back. Well, I guess I did read them back to back. I didn't start it immediately after I finished Traders, yeah. but it was within you know a couple of weeks. But sure. I definitely felt like there was some progression in your writing, and I guess maybe confidence is that word that I would. I would think of it. It felt like you had more confidence there. That that definitely, I think, was the big thing. Is like, um, you know, uh, there's like there's scenes and traders I I rewrote and rewrote and rewrote descriptions, especially descriptions because I've been like afraid of my descriptions. And I rewrote, rewrote, rewrote. Um, 
And then like the other thing too is like I kind of limited how much battle I put in traders because for some reason I had this idea in my head that I wasn't good at writing battles and then or, or fight scenes. And then like everybody's like, oh, your fight scenes are so good. I'm like, I'm going to put a bunch of them in Grave. They were fun. They were good. All right. Next question. Are there, uh, you've kind of mentioned it a little bit already, but are all the peoples in your world, do they have like a real world equivalent mm -mm. to us um, or no? So originally, yes, they all, they all definitely were. And then, so I, I've started blending them a lot more and, and I, I feel like that, that that's been accomplished better than I thought. Cause like with the Reachmen, I was afraid that they'd be too close to like the Irish or, or the Scottish, but I've had people be like, Oh no, 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 they're, they're Vikings or, Oh no, no, no. Actually I've had like, they're Welsh, you know? Um, but they're kind of an amalgam of all those things. Plus other things as well. Uh, the Soldasi originally were Italian, uh, Roman inspired, but I've kind of uh, added um, some Chinese and like Persian Indian stuff in there as well to make them a little bit more, otherworldly uh Matavians used to be german um but now they're a little bit more i don't know how i, I don't even know how i describe them but like they're definitely a little bit more magic -y than everybody else uh sorhein you know uh, that was one too that i wanted to be careful because like you know very easily with the fact that they have you know charcoal gray skin i didn't want it to be like a um racist analog or anything like that um but i mean like there's definitely like bits and pieces of different culture like uh the unclaimed girl the hatori are um kind of a arabic like math oriented culture but then i also took a south american thing where their written language isn't written it's like beads and knots and stuff like that um and uh yeah i mean like you know it's, i i, I kind of like i like to incorporate real world stuff but i don't want it to be like one for one you know what i mean sure um, yeah so it, it's there's there's bits and pieces with a lot of them. Um, I mean, the keep is basically England, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably the, that's probably it. Gotcha. All right. What, did you have a hard time coming up with so many names that start with the letter X for the Sorhain <laughs> people? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, um, I actually started like stealing from other eras of uh, Dungeons and Dragons to, to flesh them out. And then like, there's a few, um there's one that's actually just like an arsenal soccer player i think i think i put shaka and there's uh, x h a k a um but then i mean there, there, there's a few other ones where i was just like eh, what makes sense and like i've been like weirdly lucky with naming things um where like sometimes it's like real names like who knew you know um like for instance uh i thought i came up with a variation of a of an old irish English, you know uh name and it turned out that was an existing variant oh. um yeah so that yeah i don't know maybe it's just like i'm reading things and sticking with the x names though it's just kind of more like um like uh what what sounds right you know what i mean like you know because that, that's the thing too i think is if you you gotta be careful with names because especially when you have like really well-defined cultures like it sticks out like a store a sore thumb when the name doesn't sound like it comes from that culture you know what i mean yeah uh there was just kind of a something i noticed and that there, there was a maybe you already are aware of this too but in the chapter list at the beginning of the book mm -hmm. um there was a chapter that's missing in the listing is it really? Which chapter? The is Rock, it? The Rock, The Lion, The Book. Oh, interesting. I need to go back and fix that. Because <laughs> I was looking, I yeah. got to that chapter, I think I got to that chapter one night, and I was like, I wonder how many more chapters I have. Yeah. And so I went and looked, I'm like, oh, it's not there. That so. happened to me in Traders too, where uh, the formatter didn't pick up uh, one of Orton's chapters. And it, not only that, like, but it like actually like never even made the title of it so it was just like a chapter in somebody else's chapter but i think i fixed that eventually oh well if there was anything i get, didn't catch it this was just more by accident i just yeah yeah happened to notice so i didn't didn't know if you knew i didn't know like something like that i after the book's printed probably not totally much you can really do about it <laughs> totally intentional <laughs> well i mean you you can i mean it's just like uh those are like those old ones will have that in there and then um newer versions would be fixed 
Um, like uh, traders, there's a version with way more mistakes in it than what it currently exists, and uh, a hand drawn map that I like that I drew on uh, Procreate. Um, but and then I'm gonna try to get it like a better version of that eventually. And you know, it's always like you're never gonna catch it all, you know, especially like sure. um, yeah. You know, especially like I like until grave, I didn't ever had any type of editor. It was just me. And then like my wife would send me mistakes and be like, Oh, here's a mistake. Like once she eventually read it. Gotcha. Yeah, that's I mean a group effort, I suppose. Uh. Yeah, for sure. Um, this is the last thing that I've got. And then I got um Jan was the only one who sent me some questions. But the last thing I have, uh the mages of the College of Luth that I thought were yeah. really cool. Mm -hmm. And I liked that we got to see more of their magic, like that chasm illusion mm. was really freaking cool. Oh, good. Um, but I don't know, like, if I want more explanation of their magic or just leave it as it is because it works and it's magic, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I had a really hard time with that. Like, oh, man, it's so cool, but I don't know if I want to know more how it works or not. Mm. The uh, the biggest thing and like uh, unclaimed girl goes into some of the like the the very loose rules I have, but it's not you know it's not misborn or anything like that. Where there's these hard rules of how it works, the the biggest thing is like it's got it's every uh, there's a quote in the in the unclaimed girl where it's like every action has a reaction which has a reaction which has a reaction that echoes into infinity, and that's the thing is like I I think Eliad has that issue where he's like okay well I've done this and I've used all this power now where do I put it. And like, you know, he has to, that's why they wear those, um, those costumes with the masks and stuff to like, cause it's almost like static electricity and they have to diffuse it around their body. But other than that, like, I, I don't like hard magic systems, but I also don't want it to be like the deuce ex machina of magic. You know what I mean? So yeah, you gotta have that balance. Hard to find a middle ground, I, I suppose, right. but yeah. it, it works for me and it's just, yeah, it's, it's a toss up. Um, Yeah. I think it works as it is, but I wouldn't I wouldn't complain if I got a little bit more, but I don't I don't think I want too much more. Right. Yeah. Well, that's definitely not happening. <laughs> All right, okay. perfect. Yeah. Uh, uh Jan, just I, I took a few of your questions down. A couple I I'm gonna I didn't write down just because there's no way you could answer them. And even a couple of these, um I'm not sure if you really will, but uh, his first question here is he's wondering if Marilee's possibly a wrong name or maybe the worst named character because she isn't very Mary. Oh uh, yeah, that that's intentional. So especially like in the in the beginning, like I had to come up with a name for her and I forget how I came up with it, but like she has that really and it's kind of I think she or Kale remarks on it that she's very naive and doesn't really understand how the world works. And like, I mean, especially at the beginning, you know, up into the end of book one. A lot of the time, even as Terrace is dead and other things, she's she's kind of optimistic and she tries to be strong and she tries to do the, the thing. So she, but she eventually, she eventually goes down a you know a, a darker path. You know, and that's the other thing too is like how many of us like really live up to our names? I guess it's kind of subjective. Yeah. Uh, his next question here, he's wondering what your favorite band is. My favorite band. I'm uh I kind of very eclectic and my my favorite bands change all the time. My favorite of all time used to, I always say it's the Misfits, which is probably like yeah you know, they're probably up there. Um, let me think. I've been really, really into hot water music a lot the last like decade or so, and then I've been listening to like a lot of death metal lately. So I've been like really into uh, like Cruelty and Frozen Soul. But I don't know. I got it changes all the time. Not not your old own old band. No, dude. <laughs> I, mean, I listened to them on occasion. I mean, we weren't bad or anything. Like we were pretty good, but like, I, I guess you know. I mean, I've actually only recently gotten back into hardcore, uh, like of that style, because like I don't know, it's just like a weird. And actually, I didn't get into like metal and stuff. Like, there's like a weird time where I went to college and I realized how angry I used to be and like how much like how weird everything kind of was and like how I don't want to be that person anymore. So I kind of shied away from it. My favorite hardcore band of all time, though, is probably Blood for Blood. Can't say I've heard of them. It, it, it you would know if you heard them. All right. Well, I'll check them out. I'll jot it down. Yeah. Uh, how do you how do you feel about writing reviews? Um, what kind of approach do you take? I'm adding a little bit onto his question there. Um, I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and how do you as a whole how do you feel about it? 
You know, um, I, I, I like to give back to the community um, is one of the things that I, I, I feel very suspicious of indie authors who don't read indie books. Um, you know, I think that's kind of a, a disingenuous thing to do, especially like, uh, like I've seen a few people like, oh, well, well I wrote at least mine indie, but I don't think indie books are very good. Then what are you doing? Why did you release an indie book? But my, my, my thing is like, I don't, I don't get through books I don't like most of the time. So that's why like a lot of my reviews end up being very high reviews is because like, I just can't, if I really don't like a book, I'm not going to read it. You know, I don't have that kind of time. Um, and, you know, the other thing too is like, like a lot of, especially like a lot of uh, indie books, like they're, they might be not for me, but there's, there's good stuff there. So like, I try to highlight that type of thing. Um, you know, I have like, I have an English degree um and like you know a lot of my my favorite books are like more like classic literature and then a lot of fantasy is very magic-y lots of creatures and stuff like that and like i you know i prefer books kind of like my own unlike the band thing where like you know the magic's a little bit more understated it's a little bit more about the characters and the history and stuff like that um but i try to look at like i'm like okay well what did this book do good um is the writing good you know that's that's something that I, I think can really pull you along like if the if the writing if the characters and the writing is good it almost doesn't matter as long as the plot makes sense it doesn't have to be a fantastic plot the plot just has to make sense um where i think people get lost in the weeds and this is one that i struggle with is when they info dump a lot and they don't focus either on the plot or the characters but they focus on oh look at this cool thing i've created and that's something that i think we all struggle with because we all want to show what it is that we've made but like it you got to have like a very even hand with that um but yeah i, I don't know man like I, I i like doing the book reviews but I, at the same time i feel like i'm not a very good reviewer because i don't like to give um negative scores unless there's like a really justified reason and even then like i said like i can think of like a handful of books where i've started it and i'm like eh, this isn't for me and i just i, I just move on you know i don't want to i'm not here trying to sabotage anybody's career or anything like that there was there's been one book that I I pushed through and I finished even though I didn't want to. I just I didn't like it. Um, mm. That was the Empire of Silence, and mm. you know everybody just raved about it, and I'm like, yeah. you I know, it's just it. it's just not working for me. But everybody loves it, so I'm gonna just I'm gonna finish this book, but I'm you know and see if it clicks. And like, yeah, I I, I just did yeah. not like it. It was. And everybody, you know, I guess he was young when he wrote the book, and the second book's a lot better. I'm like, I, I don't, I don't. That's cool. I, yeah, yeah, dude. I, I'm I just, I don't want to commit the time to reading the next one if I still don't like. It. Yeah, dude, and like that, that's the thing is like I think um, with that one specifically, like I get why people like it, but that was never going to be a book for me. You know what I mean? Like, and it's not, it's not. I mean, good for that guy. Like he's doing so good. I'm glad. Yeah, you know what I mean? Right. But uh, like he, I mean, I'm sure he would, like if he he doesn't know who I am. But if he if he saw this, he'd probably be like, yeah, you know, I mean that his, my book's probably not for him. If he if that's like his his style, like he probably would not like my understated uh, narrative because like I mean his is very sprawling, very uh, Patrick Rothfuss esque prose, uh, lots of considerations, lots of new words, and like I don't know, like. I mean, like again, like I said, I have an English degree. I'm like I, I, I can read. I can read it. It's just I don't know if it's gonna be something I enjoy. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It was just I, I don't know. Like part of it, like I really struggle with first person point of view hmm. books, and that was kind of part of it in the beginning. But actually, as I went through, I'm like, okay, like I can kind of deal with this. It's not as bad as I thought. You know, um, I don't mind this. But I just kept going like the rest of it is just, yeah, it wasn't a book for me. So I, I feel like the thing that happened for me was every time I would get invested in a plot, the plot would reset and do something else. And I was like, you know, like I liked it when he was with that one girl on that 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 plane. And I'm like, this is really interesting. And then she dies. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And then I was like, oh, oh man, that sucked, you know? But, right. Um, and I actually thought I didn't like first person for a long time for fantasy. I liked it for like literary fiction, but I've been reading, um, Robin Hobbs, uh, Farseer trilogy, and then The Brotherhood of Steel, and both of those are some of the best fantasy I've ever ever read, and they're both first person and like shockingly good. Um, but I don't know, maybe it's just who writes it or what. But I was very surprised. 
I know I've got Robin Hobbs books and someday I'll get around to reading them, but I didn't know they were first person. But yeah. so I guess I'm glad that I did read the book in the sense that it kind of got me over that hump yeah, of, yes. you know, not liking that point of view. Uh, Jan's next question here. What the heck is Loma? Um, I Okay. So I think it's going to be revealed at least partially what she is at the uh, at the end of book three, but for now she's going to be kind of a Thanos like thing that shows up at the end of books that in other series as well that will eventually be revealed in a further series. Ah, okay. So there's a lot more to come then. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Um, he is wondering if book three will tie up all the loose ends, and I'm going to guess probably not if you've got a bigger picture to paint here. Um, for, for those characters, uh, yes, other than I'm going to do a, uh epilogue novella called The Revenge of Two um, that I, I don't, like, I mean, it, it's going to be wrapped up, but I, I feel like it's going to further wrap some of that stuff up. But yeah, I, I mean, like, uh, Marilee Kale, Eric Freya, everybody is going to have an ending that makes sense. Um, there may be one thing that people want wrapped up that's not going to be, um, but that will be in a further series because that's that's not like, you know, the 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 thing's not going to go away. It's still going to be a um, a problem uh, without saying too much. But um, sure. I'm trying to think of like loose ends. Um, I think pretty much all of them are going to be tied up other than, uh, well, I don't know how much of a spoiler you guys want from book three. Um <laughs> But there's like there's one thing that will not be wrapped up, but I will show in an epilogue that I intend to wrap it up. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, the last question that I took for him, and I, this is probably the biggest one where I feel like it will be hard for you to answer. Mm. Um, is there a character that you haven't killed, but that you do want to kill? For book three? I guess maybe just period. Um, well, there is one that I wrote the death scene for in book three that I'm very happy about, um, without going too much into it. Um, is there a character I want to kill that's not going to die? See, that, that's actually the problem I had for a little bit with getting started with Until Worms Remain is almost like, I almost feel like I killed too many people in Grave, except for the fact that it all made sense. So I almost have to think, like, step back and think like, okay, I basically more of this has to be non- killing but basically i think at, by the end of gray uh until worms remain everybody who needs to die is going to die and there there isn't anybody really left i mean there's a few people that are bad that are going to stay alive but like nobody who really deserves it is going to survive all right well i think that's all the questions i've got that i received uh from outside anything else you can think of i guess I know you've made some progress here on book three. Um, and last time I talked to you, you said it was going terrible. I don't think it's going maybe yeah. maybe less terrible now. Uh, you know, I think I, I'm finding more time to add more words. I, I actually also realized that wasn't as bad as I thought. So I'm at like almost a tenth of the way through the first draft. And I, I usually like as far as may not as far as like grammar and stuff, but as far as plot goes, it's very rare that I have to go back and rewrite plot stuff. Um, so like usually once it's down, it's down, like, unless like, I mean, sometimes like, or, and that's actually kind of how probably last time I talked to you was, is sometimes I'll start a chapter and then delete it really early on. So like I had one in a uh, grave where Conran was going to be alive. I was like, that's stupid. Delete that. And then I had a few other like minor chapters like that. I think I've had a few like that for, uh, where I'm sorry, I've like started them and deleted them, but I feel pretty strongly about, I've got a complete kill chapter, part of the prologue most of a merrily chapter and then most of a kale chapter and then okay i'll throw this one out there part of a Sinric chapter eric's brother ah okay he is the new evertree correct yes mm -hmm. gotcha okay interesting well if if there's i don't know how much i could do but if there's you know once you have the book finished if there's anything i can do to help I appreciate it, word, anything For sure whatever i can do so uh, i'm definitely looking forward to reading it once it comes out and uh, i'm glad i'll be waiting for it sounds good man i appreciate it thank you for uh, having me on yeah thanks again for taking the time here i know it's an hour later for you got school in the morning got work so um i won't keep you any later here but again thank you for your time it was great talking to you again thank you you too yep. have a good night you too bye